This introduction to Rotem Guided Transfusion has been designed to provide a minimum level of knowledge to allow users to be able to start using Rotem in clinical practice. We have only covered the basics in order to keep this package to around 30 minutes. We recommend that most people continue on and complete the more comprehensive package as well. To perform a Rotem, you need a citrated sample of patient blood. In Australia, citrate tubes are coloured blue. Unlike traditional coagulation tests, which are centrifuged to separate the plasma, Rotem is performed on whole blood. If you are sending it to the lab, you need to label it Do Not Spin. A sample of the citrated whole blood is placed in a small cuvette. Reagents are added to activate the clotting process and then a rotating pin is immersed in this sample. Over time a clot forms, then strengthens, and this increasingly impairs the ability of the pin to rotate. This impairment to rotation is detected and is displayed as a graphical image of amplitude over time. This image is called a temogram. There are many different parameters which can be measured. We are only going to discuss the important ones which are commonly used to make decisions in clinical practice. The CT or clotting time is measured in seconds and this represents the time from when the test is first started until the amplitude of the temogram reaches 2 millimeters. In simple terms this tells us how good is the initiation of clot formation. If it is prolonged, there are a number of possible causes. The most common is low fibrinogen, but others include clotting factor deficiency or anticoagulants like heparin. The amplitude of the temogram represents the strength of the clot, and this is probably the most important parameter that we measure. Low amplitude traces mean there is a weak clot and weak clots are strongly associated with increased bleeding. There are two main building blocks which contribute to clot strength, fibrinogen and platelets. A low amplitude weak clot is usually due to a problem with either fibrinogen platelets or a combination of both. The amplitude or clot strength is measured at a number of different time points. MCF stands for maximum clot firmness. However, this usually occurs any time around 30 to 40 minutes, and in most clinical situations, you want to be able to make a decision before waiting this long. Most algorithms now use A5 or A10, the amplitude at 5 or 10 minutes. Systemic hyperfibrinolysis is an increasingly recognized and relatively common condition in major hemorrhage. When present, this can be seen on a rotum trace as a decrease in the amplitude of the clot over time. This can be quantified by using a parameter called maximum lysis, or ML, which measures the percentage decrease in clot amplitude from its maximum value. Five different rotum tests are available. These tests have different reagents added in order to allow us to assess different components of hemostasis. In this guide, we will focus on the two most commonly used tests, XTEM and FibTEM. The XTEM is best described as a basic screening test, which is used to assess overall hemostasis. Calcium is first added to neutralize the citrate and then tissue factor is added to activate the clotting process. This is similar to a prothrombin time. When interpreting an XTEM, the first thing we do is look to see if the clotting time or CT is prolonged. The most common cause is low fibrinogen. Other causes include clotting factor deficiency or heparin. The next thing we assess is overall clot strength by looking at the amplitude. Measures of this are the A5, A10, or MCF. 
Low amplitudes are due to either low fibrinogen, low platelets, or sometimes hyperfibrinolysis. Finally, we look to assess if there is any evidence of fibrinolysis when the clot amplitude decreases over time. When severe, the shape of the temogram is immediately obvious. More subtle fibrinolysis is usually detected by looking at the ML. The FibTem is possibly the most useful test in clinical practice, as fibrinogen deficiency is the most common disorder to occur in major hemorrhage. In essence, the FibTem is an XTEM test to which an antiplatelet agent known as cytochalosin D has also been added. This allows us to specifically identify the fibrinogen only contribution to clot strength. The FibTem A5, or amplitude at 5 minutes, allows us to very rapidly identify fibrinogen deficiency. A low FibTem can be due to a number of causes. The most common are rapid consumption, fibrinolysis and fibrinogenolysis, and polymerization disorders caused by colloids or fibrin degradation products. Traditional coagulation tests measuring fibrinogen cannot detect these functional problems with, with polymerization and are also not usually as rapidly available as the FibTem A5. We won't go into any great depth with these other common Rotem tests, but they are the Aptem, which is an XTEM test with an antifibrinolytic agent added. Intem and Heptem are used when the patient has received heparin. These use allergic acid as an activator instead of tissue factor. It is important to acknowledge that Rotem is not able to assess some aspects of hemostasis, such as platelet function, the effects of antiplatelet drugs, or von Willebrand's disease. Some rotum parameters can be affected by anticoagulants like warfarin and the NOAX, but at present there is no clear role for the use of rotum in the management of these agents. Now that you understand the basics of rotum, the next step is to demonstrate how to use rotum in clinical practice. For demonstration purposes, we will use the 2016 version of the King Edward Rotem Critical Bleeding Algorithm to discuss the principles and explain the management of the most common abnormalities. It is important that you familiarise yourself with the algorithm that is used in your own particular hospital. And we also acknowledge that in the future, the algorithm presented in this video may no longer be up to date. The first thing to note is that our algorithm has been designed to encourage the assessment and treatment of disorders in a systematic and specific order. It is not sensible to administer fibrinogen if it is then going to be rapidly consumed by a hyperfibrinolytic process, so we prioritise the detection and treatment of fibrinolysis first. Fibrinogen deficiency, the most common abnormality, is assessed and treated second, and following this we assess the need for platelets and finally coagulation factor deficiency. In a minute we will go through and explain each section of the algorithm. You will find it more useful if you print out a copy of this algorithm and refer to it yourself while we do this. Please feel free to pause or rewind if you need to whilst we discuss each of these criteria to ensure you understand the major points. First, I'd just like to briefly present a case to demonstrate the general overall process and how quickly and easily you can make a decision. Don't worry if we seem to be going quickly, we are going to go through each section more slowly following this. This is a standard rotum, an XTEM and a FibTEM, trace from an obstetric patient who has bled about 2 litres. And this is how it would look after it has been running for about 10 minutes. A normal XTEM A5, FibTEM clotting time, and ML indicate that fibrinolysis is unlikely to be present. There is no need for fibrinogen as the FibTEM A5 is greater than 10 millimeters. 
There is no need for platelets as the XTMA5 is greater than 35. And there is no need for clotting factors as the XTM clotting time is less than 80 seconds. This shows that the patient has normal hemostasis and there is no need to thaw blood products or give the patient treatments they don't need. A normal rotum is actually the most common finding in many bleeding patients. Fibrinolysis. Localized fibrinolysis is a normal process at the microscopic level, keeping our blood vessels patent. However, overactivation of fibrinolysis throughout the systemic circulation, which can occur during any form of shock, is counterproductive during hemorrhage. It prevents clots forming at the site of bleeding and leads to rapid depletion of fibrinogen. It is therefore vital to detect and treat hyperfibrinolysis first before replacing fibrinogen. In most severe cases we don't want to have to wait for 30 to 40 minutes to see the classical hyperfibrinolytic pattern. We want to treat this earlier. So we look at some early parameters which have been shown to strongly predict its presence. If the FibTem trace is flat, as indicated by a clotting time greater than 600 seconds, or the XTEM A5 is less than 35 millimeters, indicating low clot strength, then we will give tranexamic acid. More mild cases of fibrinolysis will often be detected later by regularly rechecking the trace and if the ML is greater than 5%, treat these patients as well. Fibrinogen. Fibrinogen deficiency is probably the most common abnormality that occurs in major hemorrhage and is the second component that we assess. A FibTem A5 of less than 10 mm should trigger replacement of fibrinogen to either cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate aiming to correct to a FibTem A5 of greater than 12 mm. It is important to note that traditional 8 to 10 unit doses of cryoprecipitate only modestly increase the FibTem A5 by approximately 2 mm. This is insufficient in many patients. One of the key concepts we have come to recognize is that it is vital that more severe deficiency is recognized and these patients are given a more appropriate larger dose of fibrinogen right at the start. One way to do this is to use a dose calculation table. This patient has a FibTem A5 6 mm and the recommended initial dose is 20 units of cryo or 4 grams of fibrinogen concentrate. If the bleeding continues they will often need more. Fibrinogen concentrate is widely used in Europe and now increasingly in some centres in Australia. It is a dried powder with a five year shelf life. It doesn't need cross matching and it can be kept at the point of care where it is going to be used. For example, the emergency department, theatre or ICU. It can be used to more rapidly correct fibrinogen, especially in situations where a large dose of cryoprecipitate would be requested and may be very useful in centres without on-site blood banks. The third criteria to assess is the need for platelets. And the key parameter we use to assess this is the amplitude in the XTEM. As you, you will remember from earlier, the amplitude of the XTEM is a combination of both fibrinogen and platelets. So we need to look at the XTEM A5 and the FibTem A5. Let's have a look in an, at an example of a patient with isolated thrombocytopenia. Here we see the XTEM A5 is less than 35 millimeters, but the FibTem A5 is greater than 10 millimeters, indicating normal fibrinogen. So the correct treatment if they were bleeding would be to give them platelets. The next example is common in patients who are experiencing more severe hemorrhages, the combination of low platelets and low fibrinogen. 
which leads to an extremely low XTEM amplitude. Here, the XTEM A5 is less than 25 millimeters. It's only 16 millimeters, extremely low. And the FibTEM A5 is only 2 millimeters, very close to no functional fibrinogen at all. This patient is in an extremely bad situation and needs platelets and a very large dose of fibrinogen. The fourth and final abnormality that we assess is the need for clotting factors. Sometimes this aspect of hemostasis is referred to as thrombin generation. Generation of a thrombin burst is a key final step in the coagulation cascade, leading to fibrin polymerization and platelet activation. We assess this last because in fact this is usually the aspect of hemostasis which has the most reserve and is often the last to need correction. Here the key parameter we look at is the XTMCT. If this is prolonged then we may need to increase thrombin generation. The most common cause of a prolonged XTMCT is actually a low fibrinogen, not lack of thrombin. And this will usually correct with fibrinogen replacement alone. For this reason, we always need to assess the XTMCT and the FibTEM A5 together. In this first example, we have a patient with severe fibrinogen deficiency which has led to a mildly prolonged XTEM CT of 109 seconds. This will almost certainly correct with the only treatment needed here being fibrinogen. Remember, someone with a FibTEM A5 of 2 mm will need at least 25 units of cryoprecipitate or 5 grams of fibrinogen concentrate. In this next example, we have a patient with an extremely prolonged XTEM CT of 468 seconds and a very low FibTEM. Although this patient definitely needs a large amount of fibrinogen, they will also need FFP or alternatively a prothrombin complex concentrate to try and increase thrombin generation. The observant amongst you will have also noticed that the XTEM A10 was only 10 millimeters. This patient also needs platelets and is in a very dire state indeed, with almost complete failure of hemostasis. Before we finish, it is important to remind everyone that rotum and coagulation problems are only one aspect of treating hemorrhage. There are other treatments, many of which are even more important. I realize that we are stating the obvious, but don't forget to stop the bleeding, warm the patient and all of your fluids, correct the calcium, and of course, transfuse red cells to avoid severe anemia. In summary, this package has introduced you to Rotom Guided Transfusion. Hopefully, now you will have a basic understanding of the concepts required to use this approach in clinical practice. In order to retain and build on this knowledge, new knowledge, we would like to encourage you to invest some more time by completing the comprehensive learning package and subscribing to the Revision Cases email list. Thank you for watching, we hope you found this tutorial useful.